Okay, so um, hello everybody. My name is Valerie Dornboss and I am the um, White Swan Environmental Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals or ITEP um, intern this summer. And I'm so excited to welcome all of you to our first of hopefully um, three or four different speaker series covering a variety of topics related to air quality. Um, unfortunately, my um, supervisor, um, there was a funeral um, that was in the community, unfortunately, and so she is hoping that she'll be able to join us um, later on this afternoon, um, but for the time being, I'm going to be um, the host of this meeting. So um, thank you again, everyone, for showing up and dedicating your time. I know that we all live um, extremely busy lives, and I just wanted to make you um, aware of how much myself um, and my fellow interns all appreciate um, everything that you're doing and your knowledge that you're going to be sharing with us today. Um, so I thought we could quickly um, just go around the room and if you wouldn't mind um, sharing maybe a couple sentences about yourself um, and then we can get into our speaker schedule. Um, I'm thinking for how we're going to do this, um, Mansell uh, will be going first and then Josie um, second, Rebecca third, and then Laura, hopefully she's able to join us um, later on, will be fourth. Um, so yeah, uh, if with that, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce myself and then we can just kind of um, bounce around the room. So as I said, um, I'm the ITEP intern and um, unfortunately I'm not, um, I do not identify um, as a tribal member or with any tribal nation, but um, as a non-native, I'm very um, fortunate and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity through White Swan Environmental to um, use this opportunity to continue to work to bridge the native and non-native gap um, and move forward to together on these extremely important air quality issues and making sure that people um, from all communities have a voice at the table and can work together um, to benefit and to um, find solutions for everything. So um, thank you again personally for me um, for coming to this meeting today. And then um, also, I guess, um, Sophia, if you don't mind going next with a quick introduction, cool. Thank you so much, Valerie. Yeah, today, my name is Sophia Jackson. I am Diné, San Juan Southern Paiute, Kochan, and of Chicana ancestry. I have been a white swan environmental intern for about a year and a half. And I'm also in my third year for Northwest uh, Indian College. I don't know where I want to head with my degree, so I'm in limbo for that. But um, I'm really pleased to be with you all. And thank you so much for your time. And I'm ready to chat about air quality. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Josie, if you wouldn't mind going next. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Josie Kamka. Um, my Yupik name is Ungangach and people call me Aganasant. And I am Yupik and Lummi. My um, Lummi heritage on my dad is Edward Kamka. And his parents were um, Mary Solomon, uh, Mary Plaster, and her parents were um, Dora and Felix Solomon. And um, I am happy to be here to present um, about what I do for in air quality as a professional and also some information about um, ideas for what Lummi Nation can do um, with the Shalangan and in the community for air quality. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, would you mind going next? Sure, um, I'm Rebecca Jim. I, I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation, um, OCO. Uh, I, I live on uh, Cherokee Nation land, but I'm working in the, the nine tribes here in uh, Ottawa County. That's where I've worked for the last 44 years. So it's a pleasure to join you today because air for us is really uh, an issue and uh, one that um, I, I'd like to um, balance ideas with you about um, issues that we have and perhaps ideas you may have on how to mitigate some of them. Thank you very much. Really looking forward to the day. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Mansell, if you wouldn't mind going next. Hello, Mansell Nelson. I work for the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, um, like Josie. 
we are hosted at Northern Arizona University and uh, been working in some aspect of air quality my entire professional career of over 40 years. Um, so I look forward to sharing a few thoughts with the group. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Clarine, if you wouldn't mind um, going next. Hi, my name is Clarine Davis. Yate, she Clarine Davis. Nastaja Tachini Badatni Shkazo. Oh, yeah. So sorry. Um, I'm trying to fix my camera. So yeah, but um, I am an ITAP intern for EarthGen. And I am currently working on a project right now. I'm trying to incorporate my culture, which is my creation stories, and trying to have um, a clarity of air quality. So within our Nav my Dinek culture, we have creation stories of like changing women, spider woman, as well as um, baby's first breath. So I'm trying to do like a graphic novel and trying to incorporate some of the indigenous knowledge for Earth Gen and their breathing easier curriculum. So right now I'm like um, doing the storyboard as well as like the, the cartoon and my I'm trying to incorporate my art into that. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm also working on several projects and I want to include Mom's Air Force into trying to work with Earth Gen, maybe doing a video um, collaboration. So yeah, so thank you, Kihet. Thank you. Um, and then Melinda, I'm not sure if your um, microphone is working. If not, that's okay. But um, hopefully, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just saying a few sentences if you can. Okay. Unfortunately, it looks like her microphone isn't working. Um, Okay, wonderful. Um, well, with that, thank you again, everybody, for being here. And also, I'm very excited um, to have these conversations and to learn more um, from all of you about air quality. Um, so without further ado, uh, Mansell, if you wouldn't mind um, going first with your presentation. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation to share some thoughts with this group. As I already stated, I'm with the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. And um, we've been an organization now for about 30 years. In fact, we're celebrating our, our 30th year um, in September this year. And um, for our mission, we uh, work at strengthening tribal capacity and sovereignty and environmental and natural resource management through culturally relevant education, research, partnerships, and poly policy based services. And we do this for all 574 federally recognized tribes. On the map, you see a representation of, um, of the, the tribes that we, um, that we serve. Our vision is a healthy environment for strong, self-sustaining tribal communities. And our organization is um, about 30 full-time staff, um, plus or minus. And we're hosted at Northern Arizona University. So as ITEP employees, we are um, identify as Northern Arizona University employees. But of course, our mission extends far beyond um, the university and the state. So, um, and uh, the picture there is our current director. Um, our most recent director before him um, is now the vice president for the at NEU for the Native American Initiatives Office. Um, Murdad's been with us for quite some time, either as an acting director or the associate director. So. Um, he's very knowledgeable about tribal air quality issues. Um, this is a list of the ITEP programs that we have. Um, I'm involved with the first three um, in some manner and the program manager for the Environmental Education Outreach Program. 
Um, as you can see from the list, we have many other programs. Some of these are focused more on policy. Um, the first four programs are predominantly air quality. And then the other programs on the list um, go into a variety of media areas that um, where we're, but all of them are focused on supporting tribes and tribal staff, um, either with technical assistance, policy assistance, um, and trainings. Um, as I said, I'm the program manager for the Environmental Education Outreach Program, which includes our um, internship program, which this year expanded to a total of um, 22 summer interns, and we're expecting the to have a number of academic year interns as well. Um, our educational outreach focuses on um, K through 16, so all the way through um, college. I regularly do presentations at tribal colleges, um, predominantly here in Arizona, um, but have traveled to, to others as well. Um, our student internship program is a national program. So we recruit nationally and we place nationally. And this year, which is characteristic of most years, we have interns all the way from Alaska to Washington, DC and, and places in between. Um, we also work with um, folks on a career path. So um, help them identify um, internships and other career enhancing opportunities, as well as look at options for um, employment, uh, particularly with uh, federal agencies or tribal environmental offices. And uh, one of my latest initiatives has been a purple air at every tribal school. Uh, we've still got a long ways to go on that one, but um, we're slowly um, moving on that one. In fact, some of the ITEP interns will be helping um, with that objective. Um, a little bit more in our summer internship program. Um, as with most internships, the idea is to give um, a college student, or in our case, even high school students, an experience to help them prepare for um, future careers. Um, our focus is predominantly with either EPA or other tribal agencies or nonprofits that work with um, tribal agencies. And of course, the idea is to learn by doing, um, actually gain critical experience while working on an important project. Um, we do pay the interns and we try to pay for all their housing costs and travel costs. Um, and applications can be done via the website or you can contact me for any questions and my contact information will be at the end of the presentation. Um, one of the other areas that I work on um, with my background as a engineer is indoor quality. Um, in this arena, we're working with tribal staff with uh, technical assistance, uh, training courses. Um, we've also, the training courses include online um, scholar learning management system um, courses. And um, I was invited to, to talk about indoor quality and I had to think about that one for a little while because um, I usually take anywhere from a day to seven days of training to do uh, indoor quality training. And I was told to do it in a couple of minutes. So um, I'm prioritizing two issues that I've been working on, and that's not to say there's not many other issues and concerns. Um, so if there are other issues you'd be interested in learning more about, of course, feel free to contact me. Um, of course, for the last couple of years, we've been living with um, a, a virus, COVID-19. Um, as an air quality specialist, I've uh, been very aware of the impacts and very early on in the pandemic realized as many other scientists realized that um, there was um, viral infection was being passed through the air. 
Um, I was attending research symposiums long before CDC and the World Health Organizations finally acknowledged um, the importance of air quality um, for the transfer of COVID. Um, and now it's widely recognized. Um, the World Health Organization recognizes it, the CDC recognizes, um, and that poorly ventilated crowded indoor spaces are your highest risk, uh, particularly if people in that space are singing, loud talking, or exercising, and this would be without wearing masks. Um, your risk is much lower in outdoor spaces. In fact, um, I much prefer outdoor spaces, particularly um, for meeting with people and such. I have not been inside of any restaurants um, since the beginning of the pandemic, but I like eating outdoors. And so um, any restaurants that have outdoor eating spaces get my business. Um, well ventilated indoor spaces um, will also reduce your risk of um, exposure and um, contracting the, the COVID. Um, one of the things I do as an engineer is encourage people specifically to look at ventilation. Um, I'm frankly quite dismayed that most of the conversations around COVID focus on, are we gonna wear a mask or not? Um, mask wearing can be an important um, public safety measure, but um, as an engineer, I feel like there's many other measures that we're not talking about that we should be, um, that can actually be even better, more effective than than things like mask wearing. And of course that depends on a variety of variables, but um, ventilation by definition is providing fresh air to an indoor space. Um, I emphasize that because some people think if you have a fan uh, moving air, then that's ventilation and it's not, um, that's just air moving. <laughs> um, ventilation is um, fresh air coming in from the outside to the inside. Um, this fresh air dilutes pollutants, including um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and so it's, it's an effective strategy. Um, it takes a lot more ventilation than we've advocated for in the past. We've always known, well, I shouldn't say always, but we've known for a long time that ventilation is very important to us. Um, but with uh, the virus, now we know that it's even more important and we're encouraging even better ventilation. Of course, there's limits. Um, if the air quality outdoors is poor, that um, can limit our ability to use that outside air. Um, in some areas that I work with, um, tribes in the middle of the winter, um, above the Arctic Circle, or even um, other regions in Alaska, temperatures can, can get pretty um, cold and that can be a challenge um, for ventilating. Um, we still encourage it, but um, people worry about the cost of that and understandably so. And then of course, um, there's also different types of ventilation, whether it be mechanical um, or a natural, taking advantage of uh, natural ventilation. Um, so I could spend, um, several hours talking about ventilation and the nuances of it, but um, the short story is you want more of it, um, particularly during this time period where we're concerned about um, a virus that's um, causing death and illness across the world. Um, one way that you can measure your ventilation are carbon dioxide measurements. Um, this is a measurement that I've been doing for um, the last 20 years that I've been an indoor quality um, scientist, but um, it's a, an effective way of uh, getting a quick estimate of, of our ventilation. Um, it really only works in occupied spaces. Sometimes schools ask me to come and do ventilation checks after school, and um, at least the carbon dioxide measurement doesn't work that way. You have to have um, occupied spaces, people in there, under normal occupancy in order to effectively use carbon dioxide measurements. It's a surrogate for the air pollutants. So it's not measuring the pollutants themselves, but rather um, it's a way of measuring how much fresh air is coming into the space. 
and there are some limitations. Um, so it's something that you have to learn about to effectively use, but there's a lot of carbon dioxide measurement devices available. Um, some states have even gone to the point of requiring them for every classroom. I wish that they would be required for every public indoor space and for every school. Um, and that would be my goal um, for every space to have them so that I can determine whether or not I want, even want to go into that space. The other topic I listed is radon and I identify radon because it's um, a principal killer as a air pollutant. Um, we see over 22,000 deaths per year in the US attributed to exposure to radon. And this is exhibited as um, lung cancer and particularly for lung cancer for um, never having smoked is um, radon could be a suspect. It comes up from the soil, it's a natural element. Um, the lower parts of the building are at the greatest risk and during the winter, when the stack effect is most prominent is um, when you tend to see higher radon levels. So we recommend testing um, during the winter months. It's also the time when you tend to have um, your building a little more closed up, fewer doors and windows open. And you, there's uh, radon test kits, a wide variety of them. Uh, Melinda's on the call. I don't think she has um, microphone availability, but um, she has other test kits, not on this slide, that um, are available for loan to uh, tribes. So if you're interested in, in doing some radon testing, um, saving lives in your uh, tribal communities, then feel free to reach out to me and either uh, Melinda or myself can, can assist you. We also have a radon um, course it's an online learning scholar, learning management system scholar course. And this is a list of the things that you would learn by taking that course. Um, and so I would definitely encourage anyone who um, would like to save lives and improve health um, to consider um, taking this course. And uh, that concludes the formal part of my presentation, but I was told that um, that some of you might have questions. So I'm certainly open to questions. We've got just a few minutes. Um, and here's my contact information. I'm always anxious to help people improve their quality of life and their health um, by addressing indoor quality issues. So um, feel free to reach out for me to me for any assistance that I might provide. Um, we do also have training courses, so you can check our website. Um, for both online courses like the Radon one and others. Um, Josie just a few months ago um, helped, was instrumental in um, developing another course for um, warm climate building science and how buildings operate. So um, there's a number of courses that you might want to take advantage of. But with that, I will um, be open to any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mansell, um, for providing us with that information. Um, if you would prefer having um, just typing your question in the chat, um, we can do that. Or please um, feel free to open your microphone in whatever way is most um, comfortable for you. I wanted to ask, um, thank you so much for your super educational and really interesting presentation because I'm always interested in air quality because here in Washington and just along the west coast we have really bad mold because it's super um damp and chilly so we don't usually have like proper ventilation I'm a fan of leaving the door open all day and people are like ah it's too cold or no there's it's too gross but I'm just like the space is very musty and I cannot stand it so I'm also I'm really I'm interested if you are located in Arizona do you guys um focus mostly on um COVID and radon right now or does Arizona have a mold problem at all because I was thinking 
<clears throat> my health is not very good. And I was saying, I need more vitamin D. I want to move somewhere drier. I want to move to Arizona. I was telling myself this and my people are from that area. So I'm thinking, I want to go to school in Arizona. La, la, la. And then I researched myself and it's like, oh, some Google searches said Arizona has some of the worst mold problems because people don't know how to properly effectively keep their homes balanced with like cool um ac air versus hot dry air yeah mold is everywhere there you go <laughs> i'm not gonna get i'm not gonna get away but i guess my question is is does your program focus on mold at all well like i said i had very limited time so i chose two out of um potentially hundreds of topics yeah uh, mold is definitely um towards the top and i usually start most of my training courses to address mold because that's often on people's minds all over the nation. Um, we do tend to see some trends where coastal areas might have some particular issues. Um, Alaska, interestingly enough, is another area where I see a lot of issues sometimes because of uh, extreme cold weather and closed up homes, etc. cetera. Um, we do see it in Arizona, probably mostly because of uh, poor water management, because like things like air conditioners um, produce um, condensed water um, as they're operating, and sometimes that's not handled properly. Um, I know of a school in southern Arizona where it was just built improperly, and um, when the monsoon rains came, all the water drained into the walls and the entire school was enveloped with uh, mold. So um, we can certainly get bad situations with mold um, anywhere. And sometimes you might say the, um, the cause of it might be different from region to region, mm. um, or you might say the typical cause, because the real cause is moisture, water. Right. Um, so but yes, we definitely work on mold issues. Um, EPA has extensive websites on mold issues. Uh, mold can be um, managed, and actually it's not the mold you manage, it's the moisture um, in all climates. But in different climates, you know, it's going to be a different, um, a different strategy. Um, oftentimes, in many climates, ventilation is a good strategy, but that may not work in, in all climates, especially ones that are um, high humidity. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of like the Southeast where you have both high humidity and high temperatures. I lived in Alabama for a year. I learned um, that even the clothes in my closet could become moldy if I wasn't careful. So, um, so the management techniques will be vary from region to region, but if, if you're interested in having a more extensive conversation on mold, I'm, I'm happy to, to meet with you or you can send me an email and I can send you um, lots of reading resources that you can look at. Um, yeah, that's so. amazing. I was going to also ask um, something. My boss is more focused on returning um, the Salish Sea, the salmon people to their usual and custom kind of the San Juan Islands, which is their creation stores instead of the reservation. So the goal is longhouses for our people in the future. And at the same time, the interns, you know, are younger and they're thinking more of like, how are we going to help our community with housing? So we have longhouses for communal healing and spaces of gathering and for culture right but we also have our individual homes now and so all the young people are like we have a housing crisis nobody um <laughs> nobody can afford anything how are we going to build more housing la, la, la. um one of the routes we're thinking of is just like either like the tiny homes idea or like um having sovereign nations um, what do you call that there investing in hemp or an alternative like besides trees and lumber materials to build houses and um, we're interested in pursuing that direction and my concern 
in my head is how do we build new housing safely to best mitigate air quality, right? Because the the tiny home sounds like a great idea until it's like a little fridge and it's not good. So I was wondering if you have any resources um, for like for like build like best building practices because I, I was also in the carpentry program. Um, at the Northwest Indian College and I really liked it and my whole passion is like building building better spaces you know so that would my hope is for our nations to build healthier homes to manage mold that's never going to go away you know what I'm saying well it's not just mold Um, there's literally hundreds of chemicals and substances um, perhaps even thousands that I would um be wary of and to be concerned about but there are you know probably you might call them the dirty dozen um that that um most frequently can impact buildings and homes but uh, yes we have resources um epa region 9 um put together a um a tribal green building toolkit cool that, that's um, ex- could be very useful so if you email me i could email you back um a link to that uh, toolkit. And after you review it, if you want to make contact with um, the lead EPA staff on that, I can arrange that. We've done webinars with them in the past. I've invited them to some of my training courses in the past. Um, it's an excellent resource um, with the idea of let's build buildings right to begin with. Um, exactly. And, you know, you agree. And uh, part of that is um, building sustainable buildings um that work in the climate they're built in that's been one of the the challenges of modern housing and modern building styles is we're building buildings that um that don't work Uh, i have a double wide trailer here in flagstaff arizona it's um it's taken some maintenance but it's um 30 years old but doing well Um, i've seen a similar building in Juneau, Alaska, that was literally melting into the forest um, because the building materials were just not appropriate. The design was not appropriate. Mm. Um, So we need to be very conscious of um, materials, design, um, and the Tribal Green Building Toolkit could be a good place to start. Um, There are some architects around that um, are doing good job working with tribal communities. It sounds like maybe you want to be one of those. Um, so contact me and I can put you in touch with some of those. I have even supported interns at um, architects that are interested in, in sustainable green buildings. So awesome. Um, Thank you so, so much. Talk to me about that. And okay. I think your time is up, but I'll defer to uh, Valerie if, if she wants to allow one more question or if if yeah, I need um, to go away and allow our next presenter. No, definitely. Yeah, we can um, take one more question if somebody has something they'd like to ask. Yes, I have one. Um, Hi, Becca. Uh, I know that you you kind of ran right through your presentation, but let's hear more about the, the stack effect. Imagine we don't know what that is. Imagine what now? Um, imagine we don't know what the stack effect is. Oh, okay. Well, a lot of people don't, so it doesn't take much imagination. <laughs> um, the diagram is um, attempting to, to illustrate it, but basically what that is, is um, it's based on the basic building science that um, hot air tends to rise. And you see that with hot air balloons and and other evidence of that. So, you know, most people are at least vaguely aware that hot air rises. Um, In a building structure, when you're heating it, um, it's the same thing. Um, The hot air will rise. And what that does is creates a slight suction on the base of your home. So um, the arrows you see in this picture are depicting Uh, basically an airflow coming from the ground. It could be coming from lower parts of the building um, and it tends to flow upwards and through cracks and crevices 
in the building or even intentional penetrations like um, exhausts and that kind of thing. Um, so in general, the airflows, particularly in the winter, are from low to high. And that principle leads to lots of understanding about how to look at buildings when you're trying to manage air quality. And one of those issues, of course, is radon, because um, the radon is in the ground and it's sucked up into the house because of the, the stack effect. There's a lot of other air movement effects. Um, some of them are illustrated in this diagram. Wind will have a huge impact on how your house, the air is moving in your house. Um, and so like living on the coast where you have um, diurnal cycles for wind, um, that can have a huge impact. And uh, of course, openings and crevices in the homes can also have a huge impact. So if you'd like to learn more, um, feel free to email me and I can send you some additional reading materials. But that's a, a quick summary of the, the stack effect. And I'd like to thank Valerie and all of you for giving me the chance to share a few things with you. And I look forward to any future conversations that we might have. Awesome. Yeah, thank you um, again, Mansell. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure, um, as I mentioned, this will go on to the White Swan environmental website. So then hopefully um, other interested people can access it and then um, gain access to these really cool resources. All Great. right. Um, thank you. Uh, Josie, if you wouldn't mind um, going next. Hi. Yeah, let me get my PowerPoint up here. Um, can you guys verify that you can see that and it's a presenter view? Yes. All right. Um, I'm going to set a timer here. Um, this is just a lot of material that I think would be, it could take a very long time to present on. So I'm going to talk about my experience at ITEP and, I, and then I'm going to talk about um, air quality for lamination. Also, my agenda is honoring our beloved chief Bill, um, who recently passed away. And I'll, I'll discuss my work at EEOP, which is the Environmental Education Outreach Program. My work at TAMS, which is a tribal air monitoring service center. I don't know why I've been forgetting that lately. <laughs> and I'd also, um, I've also, um, um, prepared a little bit of information about air quality in Lummi Nation, and it is like very, very vague in general. And I'll also discuss seventh generation well-being that's specific to Lummi Nation, but um, is also pretty ap applicable to um, Coast Salish State Straits tribes. Um, thank you, my friends, for inviting me. I think um, this is like a really big deal for me. Um, personally and professionally. Um, you know, Chief Bill was my mentor and, and uh, just really, really like from when I was very young and I would go to Lummi, um, Bill and Fran were always there teaching. And I remember, you know, in the seventies before he really got started with his, um, you, know, you know, teachings in, in a, on a community-wide basis at some of the family gatherings, um, some of our elders would be talking about like, what, you know, what are we gonna do about all of this stuff? And it was always like a Mariners game on, or, you know, if it was in the fall time, it was the Seahawks. And, and um, there was lots of food, lots of salmon, deer and elk, always clams. And, and um, it was always about um, how are we gonna, how are we gonna teach um, our, our shilling and, 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 you know, that was really like, I, I thought it was kind of boring and I didn't really pay, pay a lot of attention to it, but it was just all the time. Like I was soaked in it. So, you know, when you're a kid, you're a sponge. And if you're soaked in something, you just soak it right up. And, um, you know, they, they had so much humility and, and grace and gentleness about them. And some of the things that um, we're working on overcoming are not um, are not 
gentle and kind. So I would like to, um, that's something that is really important to me to bring forward in my work, whatever I do. First, I'm gonna talk about the Environmental Education Outreach Program. And in, in that um, program, um, the first thing I get to do that I got to do is work with tribal youth. And how I got hired there is I was accepted. I completed my degree at um, NWIC in um, Native Environmental Science. And then um, I was accepted into um, the Climate Science and Solutions Graduate Program at Northern Arizona University. And I found that that was not for me. And um, um, in, you know, during that time, I was um, able to teach with the EEOP, um, with Mansell as, the, as, as, my, as my boss. And he contacted me and I told him like, okay, so these are my career goals. And he says, well, you know, come work for me. <laughs> so I kind of thought, whoa, <laughs> okay, I'll do that then. Um, you know, and it really was something like, um, like it completely matched with my career goals. So, so one of my favorite things to do in the first, the first, um, my first job with ITEP was to do um, environmental education outreach with, with um, tribal students and they're, you know, around the desert Southwest. And this is an example of some, um, of one trip that I took, I got to go to Chinle High School and it's attend, um, some kind of science fair or something and and um i did this i did this demonstration it was about um water erosion carbon um carbon filtration and groundwater modeling and we you know like i it was um it was really super busy and i had students um come through and I, you know, I'd run them through the entire model and then I would ask them if they, they learned anything and they all could mention, they all could name something that they had learned about air quality. But the really cool thing about that trip was that I had students, they would come back and they would come back with like, one student would come by and um, run through the activity and they would leave and come back with like two students. And then they would leave and come back with like six students. So. Um, in my general count, I think I, I, if I, if I count students twice, there was like more than a thousand students that came and participated in that. And I think it was just something that was really like, wow, that was so cool. I mean, it was, it was cooler that the high school students were just really interested and had a ton of questions and, and they all learned something. Um, another thing that, that I got to do early on at ITEP is I got to judge, um, science fairs and like I this is an example that I just always sometimes I still think about it um so this little fourth grader he made his science fair was about um was about like what you know keeping bones healthy and he soaked these chicken bones in milk and coca-cola and like he just decided like I am never drinking soda again it eats it eats everything <laughs> I'm only going to use it from cl for cleaning and um so I've really got to a lot, learn a lot from a fourth grader and it's just really i just science fairs the ideas that the students come up with in their projects and that the, the way they talk about learning is just absolutely amazing and it's even more amazing um in a tribal school setting because a lot of that culture and everyday living um, comes through their work in the way they talk about it and the way they talk about their environment, it completely comes through in their work. And it is absolutely certain that um, elementary school level kids and younger children, um, they just don't hide that. They, it, it's really amazing how the integration of science and um, the culture of community in a tribe on a reservation can't be hidden by a child. Um, another thing I've gotten to do, and Mansell mentioned this, is that um, I got to um, write up this warm climate building science course. And this is something um, that also includes like some information about humidity. And, you know, I have to admit, like, and Mansell knows too, I think everybody knew, like, I really didn't, I knew some building science, um, you know, like, I know enough 
um, Sophia, like I know enough that I would say like, go ask Andy Kamkoff for help. <laughs> Cause he's like a building expert there in Lummi Nation. And he really, really knows his stuff. He knows like all about the foundations and ventilation and everything, building materials and exactly what conditions are gonna cause a building to have excessive mold and, and other um, health hazards when you're under, when you're in, in construction review. But like for warm climate building science, what I did, they gave me this course material and I reviewed it and I, um, it, I reviewed it based on topics and it was kind of already organized, but like the first time I went over the material, it was completely, it was a, it was a learning curve for me. And then I got to um, review some questions and some quiz activities that are, that are um, assignments for the course. It's an online course and the co it's a Scholar LMS course and the website, the link to the website is in the bottom left corner of the slide. But, um, you know, the best I could do was I made sure that every single objective had information on it and it had um, it was, the questions from the assignments um, were answers to the student meeting those objectives. And so that was something that was a really good learning experience, though, about not just about building science, about, but also about like, how do we ask questions? And you know how how do we find answers? Because sometimes the questions that we come up with aren't a part of the problem that we're trying to solve. And then another thing that I've gotten to do for ITEP is I got to um, write this course material for um, quality assurance project planning for Radon. And um, oh my gosh, Melinda! Hi, Melinda. So. Um, I think, you know, and this was a situation where I was at the point where I needed to, um, I need, you know, I, I needed to move on and they said, no, 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 wait, we have something, we have other work that you can work on. And then, um, so I was handed over, um, to Melinda Ronca Batista and, um, you know, she gave me some material and said, can you write a, this template? And I was, went over all of this material and I studied and studied and studied and um, and ended up um, writing a template for writing for a radon quality assurance project plan. And, and this is actually in a, a, another course that I eventually um, ended up writing later. But this, is a, this was an excellent opportunity for me to really get an overview, not just of ITEP and of what EPA does, but also to think about like, you know, a lot of these things are not regulated and um, the consequences of not doing anything about indoor air quality for radon is that people get lung cancer and a lot of people will pass away from lung cancer. And so this was something where I really got to get to know um, a lot of the ins and outs of, of um, environmental protection and how laws aren't always um, regulatory laws don't always um, protect people, the individuals, and this is especially true in tribal communities. And then again, the um, link for that's on the bottom. And next, um, for, and I did this also for the TAM Center, I was given um, the task of taking nine quality assurance, um, no, no, this was quality assurance fundamentals. So, so next I was given this task of doing this, um, um, reorganizing this course on quality assurance fundamentals. So uh, I have the titles were mixed up on these. So what I got to do with this course is go through it and kind of rearrange it and, and put it in the online, um, um, Scholar LMS, and again, that link is on the bottom, and I get to teach this class, and it's like, I'm just so amazed that I get to do this stuff. <laughs> the other one I do, that the other course that I um, helped redesign is Quality Assurance Project Planning, and this course is about, mostly about regulatory project planning, 
And I also got to reorganize this course and I, and I got to do it by pollutants. So it includes ozone, particulate matter um, in the different sizes um, and also weather, weather monitoring and radon because those are frequently a part of um, monitoring regulatory programs. So the really important part, I hate, I'm sorry, I have to go over this quickly because, you know, um, the tribal, the air quality and Lummi Nation is, you know, what I've really observed that really has an effect on people are wildfire smoke, wood stove smoke, burning garbage and fireworks. And the wildfire smoke is not necessarily um, something, it's not something that comes from on the reservation all the time. So this is something that really requires some cooperation with external agencies. And then wood stove smoke is something that it, I think is super important because it affects both indoor air quality and outdoor air quality. And people don't really, I don't think enough people really realize how much that affects the elderly and the young in the home. And burning garbage is a huge, huge um, issue. But one thing that I noticed um, in my years living there was that when the tribe offered free garbage drops, that burning garbage decreased. And fireworks is another very, very big issue and almost is never talked about within the community. And I think just even having some kind of um, educational component that comes with the firework stand with the permitting process and also where um, tribal and non-tribal members are allowed to light off fireworks could reduce those, um, those, those um, lung, lung effects like a huge amount just by having like a requirement when you get your permit to um, inform people about the risks of, of firework smoke. And, and probably the most important part, I think, is the well-being for the seventh generation, because that's really what the, if this isn't the purpose of learning about air quality, then I don't think people will really be able to stick with it. But, you know, I think a, a, a huge thing is that this is like about also about tribal sovereignty and community outreach is 100% tribal sovereignty. And I, like I included these pictures, um, you know, because they include like nice clear days where you can see up to West Vancouver, you know, some cloudy days where there's some wildfire going on. And then, um, you know, just the beautiful beaches and the fresh, clean air there in the community. But really like, um, have, you, have the youth teach the youth, have people teach each other. And that's, a, that's like absolutely the, the best way to get things going around is to get some rumors started about air quality and, you know, really encourage people to spread those rumors. And another thing that I think would really, really be useful would be to inform um, like people like the upperclassmen at Lummi Tribal School, the folks at um, Lummi Indian Business Council, folks at the Fitness Center about the Clean Air Act. Because as a sovereign nation, um, you can incorporate uh, ideas and principles from the Clean Air Act into the Shalangan, into things that people are doing every day, the fun walk runs and the fun walks and all of those things can include um, a clean air component. And um, also, please don't forget, I think this is really, really important. And I hope anybody who um, watches this video recording later on, like really gets to this point, is that nobody there decided to like, we're not going to um, use our language anymore. We're not gonna use our culture anymore. And so many tribal members have a component of guilt about not knowing any of that stuff. They don't, they don't know really who they are because it was, it was that, that information was taken from them. And, you know, I think our, our beloved chief, like he told me, I remember that it was so long ago, but you know, like we didn't do anything wrong that, you know, it wasn't like we decided to give all of this stuff up. So if anybody has it in their heart to like work on this stuff, then just, you know, work on it. I think it's, um, it's important, but it's more important to remember, like, you know, we're just working on getting ourselves back and to be easy on yourself. 
Thank you, my friends. That's my presentation. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you um, very, very much, Josie. It was um, very powerful and informative. So um, thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for a few questions, um, if people have any. I have one. Over so much. <laughs> Uh, you're good. I was going to ask. Um, so I tried to research a little bit about the latest Supreme Court ruling with the EPA Clean Air Act. Or I think that's what it, it was handling. And I wanted to know if you knew enough about it to put it in layman's terms and how it affects our sovereignty and how it affects how it's going to affect tribal nations with the lack of being able to regulate in, I think it's national parks or somewhere else especially because there's so many tribal communities that live inside and around tribal space, I mean, national parks. Um, so in a nutshell, um, like it's, it's kind of the same, it's a, it's a rewind and repeat of the treaty violations that have been occurring since the treaties were signed. So like the treaties were signed and it was, it was understood by the tribes that that's what that's what was the truth and what was going to happen and it was it was understood by the government that they were just this was just something that they had to do to appease the poor stupid indians who couldn't take care of the land and um so as as the as these um programs has have progressed like with the creation of environmental conservation you know by Re by republicans and you know his like i don't know roosevelt i think was a conservation core creator and then and then along the lines after um, many many treaty violations and tribes going to court and sometimes all the way to the supreme court but usually up to the um, um ninth district court of appeals tribes going to, co to court to have those treaties enforced and have usual and accustomed um, rights to um, hunting sites and, and traditional foods that um, it's sort of assumed that like, well, we're, we're not gonna take this seriously. And it's a little bit like that, but it's also that, um, you know, there's just not going to, they're just not going to regulate carbon dioxide. So it's a, also a little bit of um, this refusal to um, manage the burning of fossil fuels has a lot to do with it. But the other, um, the treaty violations and the, um, you know, the, the federal standard of repeatedly ignoring tribal sovereignty is something that's been going on for hundreds of years. And that was that has been assumed there at Lummi Nation and the surrounding tribes since 1855. Did that answer your question? Yes, that that I mean it's a sad, honest truth, what you're saying. I was just um I'm wondering if tribal nations can go to court for this decision if if they're not going to regulate what um false i mean carbon emissions are in national parks what can we do with that decision um well i you know i really don't know i i have taken um i think three bachelor 300 and 400 level environmental law courses so I'm really not an expert, but um, one thing that I have that I, I think is true is that when um, you go to court, you have to have a really specific case. Like you have to have a case that like is extremely specific. Like you have to be able to say, this is the carbon dioxide, you know, this is the millions of pounds or tons of um, CO2 that's being released into the atmosphere. This is our um, usual and accustomed place. This is affecting us in this way. 
And without regulations on carbon dioxide and evidence that that is directly um, violating that tribe's ability to use that location in the way that it was meant to be in the original treaty, then they will never go anywhere. So a lot of times they just don't go to court. But again, um, you know, I've I've met I've read maybe forty court cases, and only you know I've only written maybe fifteen papers on on the topic. So um, I'm really not an expert. I mean, that gives me an idea, though. That's that's kind of exactly what I was searching. It's like, what's the information on this decision? Because when I read about it, it's not through a tribal lens, and it doesn't really. Um, I'm trying to read about information that is so broad and has so many players involved. We have people trying to mine, we have people trying to protect the air, we have people trying to navigate laws. So that actually helps me a lot. So thank you for that information. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's some of the things that are um, that are more valuable are to um, really make sure that there are people in the community who, you know, are are aware and involved in, you know, what their rights are, their legal rights as a sovereign nation, and a lot of that has to do with data sovereignty and issues such as that. Which I, you know, I'm about ready to write a whole data sovereignty class if um if I get some extra time. <laughs> so, yeah. Are there any other questions? I know we're over, so we're seven minutes over. Sorry to bring this over so much. Um, this is not, not a question, but I just want to say thank you for presenting your presentation. I learned a lot from what you were doing with the work that you have collaborated with your colleagues. So I just want to say thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, if there are no other questions, then um, Rebecca, if you wouldn't mind uh, moving on to your um, portion of the session. Um, surely I would, but I, I really uh, concur. That was a marvelous presentation that you gave us. And uh, the work um, connecting your work with youth uh, because they, they've they got to know it and to know it deeply to be able to uh, manage the world we're leaving them. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, cool, I, too. <laughs> it's cool, yeah. No, I know that I, you got that right. Um, and they see the world. They see it. They're so truthful. Uh, I have only a few slides that I'd like to share if you don't mind. I find it. Let's see if this works. I, because I'm no good at doing this. Um, so I didn't do it right. Um, let's see. And I don't know how to undo it. So Valerie, you'll just have to help me do this. OK. Um... Let's see. You you said you have um, trouble unmuting because I can hear you um, right now. Yeah, I'm I'm not thinking I've got these slides up the way that you need to see them. Oh, um, okay. Maybe if you go to let's see, um, is it maybe like file present? Uh, hmm. There you go. From the yeah, maybe play from beginning. Maybe that'll let's see if that'll do. So I don't know how's that working. Um, there we go. Yep, you you're all okay. Great. Um, so I I really just want to talk about what we know about um, air here in Ottawa County and what we don't know. Um, these are air issues of a community in a in a county. Um, living near a super fun site. Uh, my name is Rebecca J, and I'm executive director for Lead Agency, which is the only environmental organization working on envi environmental justice uh, in this county. 
Um, we're the home of uh, nine other tribes and, and the Cherokee Nation um, um, on the other half of the uh, other side of the river here. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of thumbnail through some of these issues. And uh, we are at a super fun site uh, and being exposed by air to lead, cadmium, arsenic, and manganese and several other heavy metals. Uh, uh, there's an, indus an active industry site, Trekker Marine, which is emitting styrene and manganese and, and other substances. With agriculture, we have um, um, uh, we have a mold issue, and that particular mold that we have is uh, Aspergillus fumigatus, and um, it's spread. You can find it anywhere in the world, probably, um, and you find it in dirt. But it's um, it's multiplied here because of a particular business in town in the area. Uh, that raises mushrooms and grows um, grows them in um, material that uh, harbors this. this, this. Um, the next is a, a, an abandoned uh, industrial site, the of Goodrich, um, and communities been exposed to benzene, asbestos, and traditionally in the past, carbon dioxide. We also deal with flooding and um, and the size of um, a Fort McBree. So we are, um, this is where we are. Oklahoma is like, a, looks like a pot uh, with a long handle. <laughs> and that would be where it's boiling over uh, at the far edge of the, of the state. Um, that's the, the, the county and the, this small area is the, where the Superfund site is. Um, we worked with the Harvard School of Public Health for a number of years to um, study what was in the air here. Um, we placed um, three different air monitors and ran those monitors for, uh, I believe, 62 weeks um, and found that yes, e even though uh, one of the monitors was farther away from the Superfund site and the uh, exposure to the uh, mine waste that's piled on the ground, we still detected uh, that some, those uh, elements and those heavy metals in the monitor that was in Miami, several miles away. Um, these, these results were written about uh, primarily by a researcher in Ami Zota and we uh, with a, a slew of people that always sign on and help out with, with those kinds of papers. Um, this particular work was done because uh, we were trying to determine how much our babies were being exposed to um, before they were born and after they were born until they were uh, up until age um, two. Um, we, we were, uh, these documents were published journal, in journal articles in showing that young children living near a Superfund site can be impacted. Um, and those those um, impacts will last a lifetime. And in some cases with mothers that are exposed, um, our children that were exposed that become mothers, um, they can pass on what they have breathed in themselves uh, to their offspring. So what happens in the air um, becomes us. And, um, and still concerns us, even though a lot of the mine waste is coming down, it's still in the community. Um, 
The Superfund site is now the whole county, and anyone living in the county can have their yards cleaned, I mean, not remediated, not cleaned, but dug up and removed because children can be playing in that yard um, and may have had uh, mine waste distributed on their property because it was used as um, a material in uh, construction. It was also used in sandboxes and um, it placed under um, a playground equipment. It was placed in playgrounds and uh, schoolyards um, and exposed children for many generations here. Um, the next thing that I would like to show you is where you've seen where the Superfund site is, and now I'm going to layer on it um, an, another industry, and this is an active industry uh, that is uh, operating in the northern part of the um, also um, releasing a great deal of styrene um, and a methyl, methyl chloride and manganese and uh, a few other uh, heavy metals. Um, it's uh, in Mansell, who probably, I, I hope his little bells are going off, um, with 181,000 pounds of this released to the air each year um, in a community that's already being exposed to other air issues. Um, this, this information is from the Toxic Release Inventory, um, one of the EPA sites that allows citizens to be able to access information about their own exposure. This is a, a picture of what aspergillus might look like if you were looking way up close to it. Um, and it is a kind of mold uh, fungus uh, that um, is very prevalent here. Once again, it, uh, we have a mushroom factory that grows indoor uh, mushrooms and, and harvests them. Um, and they grow them in a particular um, material that they that they make, and so they take huge um, uh, the, those large bales of hay, uh, those big round bales, and they they dunk them into uh, basically a, a chicken um, manure, um, and until that. Hay is uh, becomes uh, really saturated, and then they dry that out a bit, and they grow mushrooms. Then, um, when they're done with, uh, when they've finished, when they harvest, then they remove the mushroom compost, and they uh, pile it up outside, and um, and then they sell that to the community uh, as uh, uh, compost, and they, it's very reasonably sold, and people buy it, and uh, and so uh, not only the people around that facility are exposed to that material that's heavily loaded with this Aspergillus fumigatus um, mold. Um, uh, it is it goes home in pickup trucks loaded, uh, and is in the gardens. And then people are exposed to it every time they work in their garden. Uh, so anyway, this uh, what we found is that um, people are are extremely ill from what they breathe in, um, and it uh, this can go very deep in the lungs, and it's, it's hard to treat. Uh, you you look like you've got uh, the flu. And so uh, people go to the doctor and they um, 
um, maybe the doctors think it's the flu, maybe they think it's a bacteria. Anyway, they get diagnosed and given prescriptions of, of um, antipyanic. They're getting treatment, but they get treated for it year after year after year. The symptoms go away and then they come back because they have not dealt with the, the health issue of this, this particular um, substance deep in the lungs. So uh, when people finally go out of town to get diagnosed, they end up having to have um, a treatment that basically um, uh, washes out their lungs to remove it. It's very, uh, very serious situation. And so when, when uh, mold was brought up earlier, thank you very much for that question about indoor mold. Um, we have this kind of mold, but we also have another kind. So let me see. Here we go. I'll, I'll get to that other mold in a minute. This is um, the other issue that, um, that Valerie, actually, Valerie is helping me. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, B.F. Goodrich, which is now an abandoned um, uh, tire factory that uh, employed lots and lots of people for uh, 40 years here. Um, you can see that it's very close to a neighborhood and, uh, and created a, a, a great deal of uh, uh, air emissions from this factory while it was operating. There was a great deal of carbon black that was uh, emitted and um, which coated many of the people's uh, homes in that neighborhood and made it impossible to hang out clothes back in the day on your um, clotheslines. And so, um, yeah, the air was visibly uh, difficult for them. Um, and this is, this is exactly that same neighborhood. You can see the housing on the top part of this diagram, but you also see these loops. And these are um, designating the plume of benzene that's beneath the neighborhood, which uh, we believe is about eight to 12 feet beneath the ground in what they're calling a perched aquifer. Um, most of these homes do not have basements, but they do have crawl spaces. And at one point, uh, after the uh, Beef Goodrich um, closed up shop, uh, it was a couple years later that uh, it was detected by one of the residents that there seemed to be an odor and uh, visibly something uh, um, they were they were detecting, and uh, and it was found to be benzene. So currently there is a process going on called um, sparging, isn't that the word? sparging? And um, it is uh, there. Uh, any number of the scientists on this on this call can uh, correct me on that, but basically they're forcing uh, air into that perched aquifer and imagining that they're pulling out and removing the danger of this um, benzene. That there's a process that is occurring. Uh, we've asked for a town hall for the community members to have access to understanding that process and um, they will provide a town hall, and, but they won't do it until December because they want to have some data on how effective it is. Gulp. Um, this, I'd like to share with you, this is the county that I'm speaking about. This is Ottawa County, in, um, Oklahoma, in that, um, on the other side of the state where, the, where that boiling water would be pouring out. Um, this is, um, I wanted you to see how many tribes were moved here, none of them wanting to come here, but they were stacked up here together and given a sliver of, of 
of land. On the uh, on the left side of this uh, county is the Cherokee Nation. All along this river system is the Cherokee Nation, and then you find the Miami, the Quapaw, Peoria, Modoc, Eastern Shawnee, Ottawa, Wyandotte. Um, and then the Seneca Cayuga tribes, um, their remnants were all brought here and uh, stacked together. Also in this picture, I'm showing you um, uh, the flood stage. Of, uh, so this flooding occurs in this county, and when uh, this uh, when the river is in flood stage. This is what you're seeing that light blue, and then the darker blue also is, is um, indicating the 100 year flood plain. Uh, the gold along there is the 500 year flood plain. Um, so we do have flooding as an issue, which you think isn't an air issue, but it really is. Uh, and so here is the town of Miami, Oklahoma. Uh, and up above here is the Superfund side. These gray areas are uh, mine waste. And you can see um, several of them are laying in the floodplain. And so that material is picked up and comes down Tar Creek and is um, floods um, into the town of Miami. That ends up being an air issue. Um, these pink dots are laid over um, the town of Miami. Uh, anyone in Ottawa County can have their yards uh, cleaned, I, I think, or remediated, dug up, and have uh, the lead contamination removed from their yards. These are those houses that have had their yards done. You can see many of them are in the floodplain, in the 100 year floodplain, and also in the 500 year floodplain. That matters because when that sediment, when these areas dry out, that sediment is laid in here on these yards and playgrounds and recontaminate um, some of these properties. This is that basically that same area um, with the floodplain and the 500 year floodplain. And the, the, the blue dots indicate homes that had uh, significant damage done to them during um, the flood in 2007. Um, the red dots indicate homes that uh, had enough damage that they would have to be destroyed. Uh, they could not get a permit to rebuild. Um, this matters because um, these homes have to be um, uh, um, after a flood like this, um, every uh, a foot and a half above the flood line in your home, um, the, even the sheetrock has to be removed. Um, from those homes and, and done in a hurry as the mold will grow so very quickly that uh, it can get so the homes would be condemned for mold itself. Um, so mold is an issue because of flooding, but also because when this, when Tar Creek floods, it gets into the heating and air conditioning ducts that are laid in the floor of these homes. And so 
this sediment in uh, in the the heavy metals that are in tar creek get into the heating and air conditioning ducts even after the homes are dried out and um, that is another air issue that these so many people are dealing with that have those in the book. Um, I think here, here we go. I, see, I think I, I think I may have done it. I think that was it. And um, yeah, so I would go um, back. So, I did want to show you that this is what we know and what we don't know. Um, we learned uh, in the Harvard study how much of the heavy metals we were receiving in these communities, and we measured the uh, PM10 and PM2.5. None of the elements that I've talked about have been measured. And I know Mansell so um, um, piqued my interest in the beginning of his talk when he mentioned the Purple Air Network. We want to join that network <laughs> and um, believe that um, there, there should be um, monitoring done here um, on a scale to capture um, what we know must be there and help us to identify it and help us uh, um, mitigate those issues. And uh, in this site, um, uh, the chat pilot are going down so that will be continued maybe 15 maybe 15 years that will be removed and that will be a, a, a adding to the issue but each of those yards that have yet not to be remediated um, if if we uh, continue having a drought like we're having now um, those yards are going to get dusty and that's going to be uh, more dust put back into uh, our environment and into uh, exposing our citizens right now. Um, so I didn't have a fancy project to show you. I'm showing you what we don't know. What we know, what we don't know. And I appreciate you letting me share that. These uh, tribal members uh, uh, make up about 20% of the people living in Ottawa County. And uh, in many cases, we're mixed, we're mixed tribal members. Um, some members with multiple tribes as, um, as their heritage. Um, everyone has a right to clean air. And uh, we don't have and um, I appreciate you and the work that you do to help make the air better in your neighborhoods, in your communities, and for your tribes. Um, there's a lot of work left to do. And this, it, this little community has these kind of exposures. Well, look at your own communities. What are you being exposed to? Um, and how do we start reducing those exposures? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, and I, I know I'm so sorry. I think we're over time by a little bit. Um, but if anybody has questions, please feel free to pop off if you can no longer stay. Um, but I would love if anyone has questions, maybe we could take those now. I'm hearing that. Yay. <laughs> I don't have any answers. Okay, well, I have a question. <laughs> I'm always tripping people up with my questions. Um, should sensitive, should immune compromised people wear masks when they garden? 
Yeah, I, I think so. Here, uh -huh. if they, yeah, yeah, they should. Uh -huh. Okay, just I think wondering. it's a very good idea. And you know that in the in the old days, that might have been hard to figure out how to find one, but now we're living in a world where the, they're a little easier to find. Okay, well, just wondering because I saw someone post in my newsfeed, somebody who's always posting controversial stuff like, oh, they don't even want you to garden anymore because they're warning you should wear a mask. And I'm saying, oh, well, now I'm in air quality and I'm seeing that we polluted our world so heavily. And there's so much, you know, there's so much sensitive individuals who we should protect. So that makes sense. Thank you. Oh, I think you're muted. Well, I probably should be. <laughs> uh, I just want to compliment on your project and showing us like the whole process of like the whole EPA system and trying to out have a like a whole data set. So I just want to say thank you. Okay. Oh. Okay, um, well, if there are no other questions, um, I just wanted to um, thank everyone again so much for your time um, being here today. And um, hopefully uh, you have room in your schedule to attend our um, similar conversations that we'll be having the next few weeks. So um, thank you everybody and good start. And let's hope we can continue this um, next week as well. So have a good weekend. Valerie, are we having our meetings out noon or one now? Uh, I think the speaker series are at noon, but then our meetings are at one. <laughs> okay. So is next week going to be at noon as well? Uh, yes, it should be. Okay. I just wanted to close this off. I know people can pop off. That's totally fine.